My name is Ying Tao. I'm co-founder at Work in Fintech. I'm so excited to bring together this Women in Fintech event uh, for all of you today with these three amazing female leaders. Um, you know, we talked about diversity and inclusion for a long time, and it's dear and near in my heart, and I'm sure all of these amazing women will share the same as well, to have this conversation in March in celebration of Women History Month. Actually, this morning, I was at a New York Stock Exchange ringing the opening bell in celebration of Women History Month. And I saw this fearless girl standing in front of New York Stock Exchange, and it was very emotional. Amazing panelists that we have today, they are brought over all of their experience and lessons learned, but also best practices in what they have been doing, driving diversity and inclusion in the FinTech industry. And I can't wait to introduce them and hear their stories. So without further ado, I will ask each of the panelists to tell some stories about themselves and quickly introduce themselves to the audience. So I'll start with you, Nadia. Can you uh, really quickly share your story and tell us about your book? <laughs> and then uh, so we will get to know you. Um, thank you so much and I love the fact that you've just shared that really like heartfelt moment of seeing that girl outside the New York Stock Exchange because this is what it's about. It's about us showcasing to the world that women need to be more representative in, in these areas of society and in financial services today. The consumer is so important and women are consumers so we need women within these roles to build the products that make sense for the, the consumer that we're after and just to give people a background on me and why I'm so passionate about this I have worked in the recruitment sector since 2005 placing technologists and salespeople into financial services so I saw you know the onset of fintech and I've seen the changes that have happened in financial services and I remember the days where diversity, equity and inclusion were not words that people wanted to say within this sphere. And now people do want to talk about these subjects, which is great, but I believe we must walk that talk and be really action orientated. So my book, surprise, surprise, is called FinTech Women Walk the Talk. And it quotes 118 women across the financial services sector who are talking about exactly what they have done to drive inclusion within their businesses, how they have grown within their careers. And I'm very happy to say that Pyle is one of those women. So I'm already starting to introduce <laughs> her. And I call these my, my great and powerful, wonderful women of FinTech. And we've got one here with us today, but I am a real, real advocate for helping the businesses who want to become more inclusive, helping them know where to start. And the reason why I know where to start and I know what the great things are that you should be doing that will make amazing impact is because all day, every day, I speak to the change makers and I've been recording podcasts with those change makers since 2018. So if you want to see any of my podcasts, FinTech with Nadia, the DEI discussions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nadia. And Pio, can you quickly introduce yourself and what you do and what brought you to Women in FinTech? <laughs> Sure, sure. No, so uh, of course, you know, really honored to be part of the panel today. So, so thank you so much um, for the opportunity. Um, so, myself, Pyle Reina, and uh, I actually wear a couple of hats. So, I'm the founder of the FinTech B2B marketing community, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. And I'm uh, also a global head of marketing for uh, a leading FinTech uh, organization. So, so having those two hats on is really interesting because it kind of gives you perspective about what does it mean when you are actually in the industry working plus and on the other side of the fence when you are helping and supporting your fellow community members. So my background, I've been in B2B marketing uh, for over two decades. Um, work for a number of global brands like Microsoft, G Capital back in back in Canada, uh, currently here in the UK, working for Barclays Bank. And so, yeah, so I've always been within the financial and technology space in marketing. However, I think pandemic, and I just want to kind of remind us about COVID-19. I know some of us like, no, we don't want to hear about that word again. Um, 
that kind of, for me, changed the, the whole landscape, not just from a marketing standpoint, but from an industry standpoint. And that was a wake up call for myself that, you know, motivated me to start this exciting community in addition to my day job. And, and of course, all the listeners who are listening to us today, you know, hopefully all our experiences could inspire each one of you or maybe have like a, you know, even a 1% of an impact so you can actually get motivated and, and, and make those changes in your life. So uh, back in March 2020, when, you know, I was along with all of us were forced to look at the world through the Zoom lenses, one of the key questions was, how are we now digitally going to network? How are we going to share insights? How are we going to drive customer acquisition? How are we going to help each other out? And particularly, of course, you know, diversity and inclusion is a, is a, is a very kind of a strong uh, subject topic being talked about. And now we all are kind of in our houses trying to just reach out to each other in Zoom. So, um, and, and also particularly, I noticed there's a lot of silos within the financial services and fintech industry. Um, so there were tons of communities out there looking at technology, banking, financial services, but they were not converging together. And that's super important from a fintech standpoint, as all my fellow participants would agree, that as a fintech organizations, we sell our services or products or solutions to financial services. So why not bring our, 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 our peers in financial services together and not just have you know, discussions around fintech? So, so, so that's when the community was formed, uh, trying to break the silos operating uh, and the convergence that's happening within financial services and technology. And it was more kind of to helping each other to network, helping each other to, to become better of who we are in terms of, you know, from a, from a professional standpoint, from a personal standpoint. Uh, and, and super delighted that, you know, over a period of less than a year, we actually grew strong, like 2000 plus members. So, so from my story perspective, diversity and inclusion plays a super important role because and, and we work very closely with our partners like Harrington Star and, you know, thanks to having um, inspiring folks like Nadia on, on the industry there to, to help us get the story out. And Nadia made a point about where to start. And, and we ran a campaign for a community because as a marketers, we are the brand or the face of the organization. So whilst Nadia comes from an HR recruitment standpoint, marketers, we are the one who is, you know, bringing and those products and services out in the market. So that means we have got a huge role to play to move the diversity needle. And, and that's where the community, you know, the whole community got started. We looked into diversity and inclusion. We set up some webinar series where we were educating our fellow marketers about how can they make a difference. And a good example is, for example, at Torstone Technology, uh, you know, uh, given where I am in the organization, I can actually make that influence and make the change. So helping our senior managements or CEOs to, you know, to help them recognize that we should be helping the, the FinTech 17%. I know Nadia, now it's 19%. You're <laughs> so, so helping marketing, like, you know, making those decisions to the senior management level, helping them to recognize it and start acting towards it. So we started partnering with like Code First Girls. Anyways, I can, I can talk for hours, but um, you know, absolutely delighted. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's good to be kind of having those dual roles um, and, and working with fantastic community globally. Awesome, thank you so much. And both of you are joining us from UK. And now we're going to switch the gear a little bit to the US. And as you all know, one of the mission for working in FinTech is really to educate, inspire young people to dive into this enormous opportunities in FinTech in general. And I'm so delighted to uh, introduce our next panelist, Will In from Princeton, US. Will In, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and you know what is your connection with uh, FinTech? Yeah, for sure. First off, I wanna say thank you so much for having me on the panel. Um, I know Gayatri wished that she could be here, but excited to be here on her behalf. And can I just say both all of you are such inspiring women in fintech and as someone of the Gen Z generation, super excited to just have the opportunity to hear more about your stories. But I'll give myself a quick little introduction. Um, 
I am currently a sophomore at Princeton studying economics with certificates in computer science and statistics. Um, I'm originally from Singapore, but grew up in Hong Kong, uh, Singapore and the Netherlands. So definitely have that um, third culture kid background. And I've embarked on many entrepreneurial journeys, but most notably started a startup focused on promoting gratitude around Southeast Asia when I was in eighth grade. And then most recently, a media network of five podcast shows all for and by women entrepreneurs called uh, the Entrepreneurs Network. So I love, Nadia, how you have a podcast too. So we can definitely talk a little bit about the podcasting space. Um, this year, I was elected to be a member of the board member of the board for NASDAQ's Entrepreneurial Center, and I'm currently working on the Venture Equity Project podcast for them. Um, and I've had the amazing opportunity to dip my toes in fintech and the VC world over the last couple of years, working very closely with Gayatri on Advita Capital and the work she does at ChiVC. Most recently, I've um, actually been working on the first ever Gen Z um, Web3 conference, which is gonna launch in fall 2022, all surrounded on helping promote diversity and inclusion within these next steps. So really the questions that drive me and what I love about Advita Capital and GVC is um, they ask the questions of what does it mean to shape the next generation of women and women in color in fintech and in spaces like venture capital, but also how can we share stories of women LPs and G, uh, GPs and in fintech to understand shared experiences and empower them and the next generation. So super honored again to be on this panel um, and excited for the discussion today. Awesome. Thank you so much and welcome all three of you. And we're going to dive into the conversation a little bit by um, talking about um, the elephant in the room. And the reason I call it the elephant in the room is uh, I find it's quite interesting, even during my days on the trading floor on Wall Street, because every single time when people talk about diversity and inclusion, it felt like, oh, it's the nice thing to do. It's the noble thing to do. I myself felt that way too, right? It's political correct, or you just want it to be more inclusive. But the more I dive in and the higher position that I got, right, during my work journey and now being an entrepreneur, the more I felt like it's not just a nice thing to do. So I actually wanted to invite each one of you to share your view of why, but specifically in fintech. And also uh, each one of you had deep expertise in recruiting HR, community marketing, and investing, and also Gen Z. So can you also share a little bit of um, best practices, success, or even like uh, lessons learned, right? As you're ha keep having the conversation around this topic, in your specific domain. So can we start with Nadia? Yeah, I would absolutely love to, and great question. Um, I think it's really important when we're having this these conversations that we're really clear about where we stand on this, because you're absolutely right. One of the biggest challenges I face um, as a recruiter working with different businesses and helping them grow is where do they put the diversity, equity, and inclusion conundrum on their radar? You know, is it is it within their DNA and this is something that they believe will be the core of their success as a business or does it just land at point 27 at a quarterly town hall meeting which they barely get to and everyone's half asleep by the time they get there and there were three minutes to cover it but they feel like they've done their job on DEI and they've ticked that box and I think for me it's really really clear and we have to raise awareness and open people's eyes to how they're behaving and how much stronger they will be if they behave in the way where this is right at the heart and center. And for me, it's not just a social justice issue, which of course is very, very important. But let's just take that out of the minds of the CEOs of the world right now, because social justice, let's be honest, isn't number one in, in a lot of CEOs' minds. However, if we think about revenue, if we think about profitability, if we think about stress testing a product, if we think about challenging the industry, coming up with new innovative ideas, how are we ever going to do any of that if the same people are talking to the same people 
And those same people all come from the same backgrounds. They all, they all laugh at each other's joke, jokes. They went to the same school. They grew up eating the same food. How is that ever going to be able to handle the speed in which financial services and fintech in particular is changing? So for me, social justice is number one. But for when I go and meet with all the hundreds of clients I meet with, I can tell immediately if the CEO I'm talking to cares about social justice or cares about revenue generation. And unfortunately, we need we need both. You know, good CEOs need to care about their revenue generation. But I believe that if they can make that success inclusion connection, and I talk about this within the book because so many of my women of fintech spoke about this, if that connection can be made, then businesses and workplaces they thrive and they breathe. The DNA is all about diversity, equity, inclusion. There's psychological safety. It's not just surveys being sent out and then people being surprised that, that the only person of color or the older person within the group or the person from a neurodiverse background hasn't answered the survey. Well, of course they haven't without psychological safety in the business. And don't tell them that it's um, anonymous because you know they don't trust you because there's no psychological safety. So this is why I talk about DNA. So I've just given a, you know, a little example there, but I think there's lots of things that businesses and managers will implement to try and drive uh, what they think is enough for DE&I. Um, and in their mind, is that box ticked? So they send out a survey to see if everybody's feeling comfortable and happy. Um, or they implement quotas when it comes to recruiting. Or they say, well, we have, we have got a um, DEI committee, but who's in that committee? Anyone of any, any power to change anything? Anyone that can, can really you know, um, turn, turn something around or have ramifications to the um, injustices that are witnessed? Um, you know, anyone that can do that. So my examples of what I'm bringing to the table is there are some wonderful things that people do. Committees are great. Quotas are great. Having networking events are great. Um, surveys are great, but on their own, they're not. And they get totally undermined if it doesn't come from a, a connection. And that connection to me is success inclusion. Definitely. I think, you know, um, even from a psychology perspective, right, one of the most important thing in more than psychology and science is um, what people really care about is significance and belonging. And I think that's actually uh, over the last uh, decades, right, of modernization, digitalization, and even during the COVID, right, as uh, Pio mentioned earlier, you started to see human beings are dying, right, for connections with each other. And to the point that you mentioned about um, diversity, right, and inclusion, it becomes a very important ingredient for any organizations who even wanted to just focus on the revenues, right? You actually cannot ignore um, the cost you're going to pay without a diverse and also inclusive uh, workplace. Pio, uh, from your experience right, in the marketing uh, and also branding space, um, what do you think why uh, we need um, to talk about DEI in the workplace? Sure, sure, no, I will. Uh, before I kind of answer that question, just want to kind of comment on a couple of points with Nadia just, just mentioned. I guess the first was an excellent point about the board doesn't kind of, you know, social justice is important for them uh, and but they are looking for the numbers and ROIs and stuff and I guess a couple of kind of points to bring um, to bring that to life is like McKinsey did a research a um, couple of years ago there might be a new research now but the last research which I looked at it said that the companies in the top quartile of gender diversity were making 25 percent more than an average profitability so there are some, you know, clear statistics there to support what Nadia just said. And it's not just a talk, but it is a clearly demonstrate what's already happening outside in, in, in the industry. Secondly, uh, you know, I, I guess NASDAQ did a fantastic, if you, if you all remember NASDAQ last year, their, their proposal uh, was approved by the, the Securities Exchange Commission last year where they wanted to bring greater diversity to the board. So when that news broke out, I think that was a huge news, a big news, because a company like NASDAQ, you know, one of those giants, when they are trying to 
you know, make that change, that sends a very, very strong signal and message to the market to say, wow, NASDAQ is doing that. Then, then you know, everybody wants to kind of follow uh, what the big, big guys are doing. So I think it's kind of, again, back to the point, walk the talk, uh, which, which Nadia is <laughs> saying, you, you need to demonstrate by examples there, which is super key. And, uh, and, and businesses like NASDAQ, and I appreciate, uh, uh, Vilain, you, are, you, you mentioned you are probably in the boat. So I think that's where we all can make an impact uh, in our whatever level of position where we are in to, to make sure we are sharing these stories internally in our business. And again, marketing plays a key role. Because if you think on marketing, it's not just the external marketing, but it's also internal marketing, which is helping to change the mindset. Because marketers, we sit in the middle of the organization. So we are customer advocates, uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure we're helping the business grow. But we are customer advocates to make sure everything is being followed under compliance, legal, uh, because sometimes, you know, the sales is always hungry to get more, uh, more, more, more leads and more business. But then as a marketer, we put a stop on in terms of, you know, what we think is the best interest of the organization, our clients. So, so, so as a marketer, that gives us much more power. Uh, much more uh, position because we work closely with media, with PR, with communications, digital, social. So, you know, imagine all the power we have with the communications and media to help change people's mindset is amazing. So I guess the bigger question is who owns d in an organization? Right. So, uh, uh, you know, again, going back to our community, like FinTech B2B Marketing, we, we, we kicked off these DNI webinar last year. And in our first webinar, we, we invited uh, 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 Lucinda Wakefield and she was, uh, uh, you know, heading diversity for BNY Mellon organization. So, so if you are, have got big organizations, you know, you probably have got much more focused experts who are looking into this. But then if it's a small size organization, a medium-sized organization, who owns the DNI? Is it HR's job? Is it a marketing job? Or is it, um, you know, someone else's job? Or is it a, um, a, a recruitment partners? Like, you know, where does that sit? So I think that's a super important question. And usually everybody says, oh, I don't know if you know a small organization, but that's probably where, coming back to my point, marketers, we sit in the middle, we connect the dots, whether it's ops, technology, um, whether it's sales, it's business development, it's customer success team. We actually bring everything together. We package it in the messaging and then we position it externally. So I think as a marketer, we probably have got a greater role. And again, giving a, 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 an example in terms of a torchstone where um, I'm very much passionate about diversity and I actually brought it back up in the agenda. I had a conversation with HR, had a conversation with CEO, we had a whole proposal put together because it's a huge value in, in helping each other out. And, and also personally myself, like I'm, I, I was born in India. So uh, I've, I've, I've traveled across the globe. I worked in Canada. I've lived in Canada. I've, I've worked in UK, lived in UK. So I'm, I'm, I'm not born and bred in these countries, but however, you need to go through all those, you know, hoops to, to come to where we all are in our respective positions. Right. So, um, but, but I, I would say it, it's, it's leading by example for me. Number one, that's a top tip for anyone who's aspiring folks listening. Number two, have a support from your senior management. Luckily, my journey was touched very smooth throughout, even though I was in different countries and, you know, I wasn't born in those countries because I always found some strong allies and champions in my company who were always helping me to, you know, they were helping me out to where I am. So um, I was touch with lucky that I never got um, discriminated or, you know, wasn't being kind of given opportunity to do what I wanted to do. But again, it's make sure you have got that, that kind of an ally in the organization mm -hmm. or, or support from senior management or from your managers somewhere. Um, and of course, it's not the case everywhere or outside the organization, like communities, like, you know, like all what we're talking here today to make sure, you know, you have got that intelligence. Uh, number three, I would say is 
another way of marketing and of course partnering very closely with HR is that building the DNI into your KPIs of your organizations, right? We all have a performance appraisal. I know some organizations um, don't do it as frequent as some others do. Why don't we put those KPIs into our DNI metrics? So we all get measured in terms of when we are hiring, you know, we have got those goals and targets set. So there's no kind of, um, you know, there's a saying, you know, if you don't measure it, it, it never gets, um, it never gets implemented. Yes. Exactly. So that, that would be my third top tip to make sure, you know, in, incorporate those key company and your business KPIs and add the DNI KPIs into it. Definitely. It takes a village, right, to move the needles in anything. Uh, Willing, on that topic, uh, what's your thoughts on why DI matters? Uh, and as an immigrant yourself, right, um, and investor, and uh, maybe you can also share a little bit of uh, she VC, right, what the initiatives that you guys are doing in the investing world, and why do you think it's a value of female founders even in starting their own companies or even getting the, uh, the funding that need, they needed uh, to scale? Yeah, for sure. So kind of echoing what everyone else has said, there's such clear statistics, especially in the investment world that say that investing in women of color, investing in entrepreneurs of color gives back high returns and there's clear statistics to back that up. And so um, the question here is then why, why are they, why do we still see a gap in um, the amount of funding or the amount of access to capital that is being um, funneled to these entrepreneurs of colors? Um, and I think a big part of that is that a lot of companies have committed to saying that they um, saying that they prioritize DEI, but they're not actually implementing it in um, actions and kind of what Nadia said, they're not implementing it in their DNA of the company. So I think at the core of it, a lot of um, a lot of fund managers need to have a change of mindset when they approach this space and also realize that lip service is not gonna be enough to actually move the needle forward. I think in terms of the work that CVC does um, and something that Gayatri has always told me since I worked with her, um, is that CVC started from her own pain point in the space where she felt like there was no voice for women GPs and LPs. And she felt like she was isolated in her experience as someone who was an immigrant and as a woman of color in the, as a GP. And so what she hopes to do through CVC and what I helped her with is through the podcast is to eventually um, back more women founders by sharing more stories of women GP and LPs. And by sharing these stories, hopefully to create an experience that's less isolated for future women GPs and for women of myself and the next generation to be able to look up to these women who are, you know, quite honestly, killing it in the space and are super inspiring. So I think there is a point of um, cross generation that Gayatri is definitely helping with where she's able to inspire young girls to see that GPs and LPs is a space that they too can be a part of. Um, I think also something that um, as part of my work at NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, one of the things that we talk a lot about is um, asking the question of um, why is there a lack of access to capital? And one of the founders I was able to talk to um, attributed this to like three main things. Um, so the first, uh, three main barriers of entry. And so the first is the lack of know-how and knowledge. And this comes from language barriers in the venture capital world. The second is lack of social capital and network, especially at the friends and family stage. And the third is lack of resources. So out of these three categories, I think there's a lot of work that we can do to push the needle forward. Definitely. And that's actually really in line with what we are trying to do at Work in FinTech. Because the reason I resigned from Barclays and Paya, you and I actually, uh, I, I just find out today that we actually both worked at Barclays. But I spent 10 years right at Barclays and spent almost 16 years on Wall Street. Uh, and then earlier last year, at the start of the pandemic, I decided to resign and co-found a working fintech with my partner, Mike Chang. One of the uh, knowledge gap, right, in the space that uh, there's a lot of opportunities, but not everybody is aware of the opportunities. 
But one thing we find so inspiring is we probably spoke to roughly 200 to 300 uh, CEO at the leading fintech firms, plus all the technology and financial services. Every single company is expanding, is hiring people, and they started to really pay attention to DEI. You notice that the shift or the trend from just a lip service, from just our ROI, from just the check the box exercise, to people started to realize the cost they have to pay when they are not really attending to DEI and started to get serious and implement a lot of the initiatives to driving diversity, to actually uh, open them up, right, to different talent pool and hire people. And I think one of the interesting uh, other side of the story, right, so in addition to talking to corporations, we also spend a lot of time talking to students, young people, and also people like me and uh, Paya, right, who worked in traditional finance or in technology, but started to get really interested in the fintech space. And one of the interesting topic I wanted to get each one of your view on is um, the notion of imposter syndrome. And you hear that a lot, right? It's saying uh, people started to see corporations opening up, really diving into diversity. There's a lot of programs, right? Or like a funding even for, right? For people who wanted to apply for a job or people who wanted to start their own company and started to fundraise one of the, this like word, right? Kind of flowing around is I imposter syndrome. I probably need to do more before I can really get ready and jump right in. So from your experience working with diverse candidates, um, whether it's uh, job seekers, executives or founders, What's your view uh, in imposter syndrome and what are some of your advice for people of color uh, for them to really embrace these huge opportunities um, and have their voice in the space? Shall we start with Pio? Oh, yeah. Or um, <laughs> it's, it's a very much uh, discussed topic here and um, it's, it's hard to kind of give one piece of advice because we all are unique and different. So it's not like one size fits all. Um, however, yes, it, it exists and probably more from a gender standpoint, uh, you know, female and, and, and there was a, a research uh, done, I, I think a year ago, which said, if a female is applying for a job role, she will make sure she kind of, you know, matches 90 to 100% of the criteria, whilst the male counterparts, even if they match 50% on the criteria or 60, you know, they would be applying for the job. So it's one of those things, uh, you know, from a gender standpoint that um, as women, you know, we probably want to, and I'm not trying to generalize it, as I said, everybody's different. So, so, so it's that, that's more kind of from a research statistics which we demonstrated that in, in terms of then um, looking at what advice can we give, how can we help lift folks from colors and race and stuff, I would say is, um, first and foremost is, you know, believe and have confidence in yourself. That is very important to be persistent and to have confidence because you might have one or two experiences where you're feeling anxious and you're like, oh, I probably won't be able to, you know, qualified for that interview. I don't think so. I have a chance because of whatever kind of, you know, anxiety level you might have, although you kind of feel confident that time. But it is being persistent, being making sure that you have got that confidence which is, is, is very key. Now, the question is, it's easier said than done because you know we can give all these advices, but then when the reality kicks in, then it's different. And that's why I guess back to my earlier point I made in the previous question um, you, you asked was around allies, making sure you've got the support. That's so important. Having the support of your network, having, um, you know, uh, having like, you know, part of, be part of, uh, communities network support allies that's super super important because you know alone sometimes you might have all those negative thoughts and ideas which will kind of demotivate you but together we are very strong and powerful to help each other like you know um rise uh, in terms of whatever that uh situation or problem is it's just uh you know injury being one example there but i would say be persistent be confident make sure you have got strong allies be part of the communities or networks wherever 
whatever you are in that fintech chain you know you might be in ops you might be in tech you might be in anywhere because there are tons of people out there to support you and and guide you and and have mentors i think that is another way to to uplift um your your you know your that confidence level um again having mentors is is a fantastic way and and, and you know just to kind of going back uh, when this community was started, this is a very much a peer-to-peer, -peer, a non-profit organization community. And I was thinking, what are the challenges I face? And I was like, I wish I had a mentor. I wish, you know, sometimes you want a mentor, but you don't know where to go, where to start from. So it's like having, wherever your, your communities or networks are, make sure you bond with them very strongly. Uh, I'm sure Nadia probably might have something more to, to add to that. <laughs> Um, totally, because I am so passionate about this. Like, I think everything that Pyle said there is is absolutely spot on, and there's some really good bits of advice that people can take away. In my mind, whenever we talk about imposter syndrome, actually, I go back to why do we have imposter syndrome? Because I am a person that definitely has it. Um, I, it's a challenge for me day in, day out. And just to be really clear, um, you know, I'm now Chief Customer Officer of Harrington Star. We founded a business back in 2010. I started in recruitment in 2005. Um, I'm, I am the most senior woman within the, within the room. I'm one of three most senior people within that business. And every morning, you know, rest assured, every morning I think, oh, can, can I do, can I do this? But I am reframing it and saying, well, good, I should be asking myself, can I do this? Because it means that I am progressing and I'm, and I'm not resting on my laurels and I'm pushing myself further forward. But one thing that I think we all need to think about, and this may be controversial when it comes to imposter syndrome, is we know that women have imposter syndrome and now we are talking a lot and raising our awareness of people from various cultural um, or diverse backgrounds having imposter syndrome. And actually, what are we talking about here? Because there is a certain demographic that is in, in, um, in, in a privileged position within the world of financial services and technology. And that particular demographic has often in their childhood been surrounded by you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Here's an example of someone doing it. Let's talk to you about finance at the dinner table when you're a five, five year old boy after daddy's gone to golf or whatever it may be with daddy's friend that, that is an investor. It, it, actually, you know, these young boys have had mentors from that age and, and the conversation around them from that age. And the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because I've got um, a boy and a girl and um, I mean, look, they're, they're both under two, but already I am starting to see the way that the world treats the girl. So she loves to wear crazy outfits and I let her wear whatever she wants. You know, some, sometimes with a hat round backwards and sunglasses when it's raining, but she can often look like a boy. And we go into a shop and, oh, hello, big, brave boy. And, you know, we, we are all conditioned to it big brave boy and I say no she's a girl oh aren't you beautiful aren't you pretty little girl their their voice has changed rather than the than her being big she's now little and small and delicate and fragile and weak and I think we often overlook this that as women um and from from my cultural background I did not I was not brought up in a in a room where it's yes you can yes you can yes you can it was free if you want to you can but it wasn't this constant you know push me forward so I think we all kind of sit here and go oh, I have imposter syndrome that's you know that's a bad thing but but perhaps we weren't brought up to believe you can you can you must you must you must and actually I think that it's really important just to look back at your, your background look back at where you came from and it's not a weakness it's just a difference in what is seen as the norm in this industry right now and we will soon be the norm in this industry right now. So let's let's unpack it, let's reframe it, and let's see it as a positive. Definitely. I like the point that you make, Nadia, about changing the language, right? Because that's actually really just to reconditioning uh, the environment. And the more people talking about, yes, you can, hey, this is the new CEO rather than female CEO, you started to really believe right in that direction. Uh, well, Lynn, anything you wanted to share on this topic? Yeah, for sure. I just want to say that um, even just hearing other women who are successful in their own respective industries share about their experience with imposter syndrome 
is to me very like it resonates a lot with me I think because oftentimes I um, oftentimes I feel like when you deal with imposter syndrome it's something that you deal with like by yourself like right when you wake up you're like can I do this today and it's not something that a lot of people talk to so I think it's really awesome that we're here today talking and sharing our experiences um, I think to kind of piggyback I completely agree on this idea of language and the way that we um, treat language not only within these different industries but even outside in our personal lives when we deal with uh, genders and also the ways that we speak about you know women um, versus men but I would say I have like two main pieces of advice I think the first one comes a lot from everything that I've done to this point have has made me feel like an imposter when I started my podcast a year ago I had never done a podcast in my life when I worked with Gayatri I knew basically nothing um, little to nothing about the venture capital space when I worked um, with Nasdaq's Entrepreneurial Center, I looked at all of these 20, 30, 40 year olds who had already founded five to six different companies. And I sat there and I was like, what the hell am I doing here? What do I have to offer? Even on this panel, I look at all of you ma majorly successful women and I'm like, what can I offer today? And so I think imposter syndrome, especially at the college level, is definitely something I think about a lot, but I think there's a lot of things that we can learn. I think, first of all, the way that we look at imposter syndrome, um, for a long time, I looked at something, I looked at imposter syndrome as something that was very debilitating to the work that I do. Um, but now every time I ask myself, can I do this? Um, I write on a piece of paper and I write, I can do this, but how can I do it better? Or I love where I am right now, but what is one thing that I can do tomorrow that might make it slightly better, might make me slightly happier? And I think it's that imposter syndrome and looking at it from this perspective that can really drive change. Um, the second thing that one of my friends told me um, after one of our exams was um, I was telling her how, how I didn't feel super great after the exam. I didn't feel like I had the confidence to take the exam. And she said that there's nothing stopping you from having the confidence of a white like Adam out there or like a white Luke out there. And I was like, who clearly, so she said, there's nothing that's stopping you from having the confidence of like a white Adam who knows way less than you do. And I was like, that's such a funny way to think about it. Like there's nothing stopping me from having that confidence. So I think a part of that is just fake it till you make it. Awesome, I really love it. And, and I was just going to add, so what you said was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and I will just add is sometimes like small things like positive affirmations. I know Oprah does lots of kind of, you know, talks around that and motivation speakers, but that really works. Like, you know, uh, small those things like, you know, really works kind of, you know, getting up in the morning, just, you know, closing your eyes and believing it, it makes a difference because it changes the way you look at the world. And, and, and that reminds me, um, uh, Vilaine, when I was uh, probably in my, uh, not probably telling my age here, but when I was uh, in late 20s, early 30s, and I, I, I was on the board for uh, in the UK, and there were all the white men with white hair, and I was the only female there. And uh, so when I joined the board, you know, I always walked in to say, you know, I know I'm a subject matter expert in marketing, nobody else is. So you actually walk into that room saying that to yourself, because that's reality, like nobody else, everybody has something to offer. It doesn't matter if they're founded four companies, five companies, or, you know, they all have a story where they all started from somewhere. And, 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 and when I was on board, then I actually had a power to bring HR on the board. She was an HR head of HR lady. And I was like, you know what? Um, so it's kind of helping as a female, there's a woman to helping each other out. So literally in a, in a couple of years time, we had two females on the board for marketing and HR level um, and, and kind of having that platform and forum to, to, to raise uh, their, their, their opinion and voice. And just kind of the point, Nadia, you made about your daughter and, and the son, I think one point to, to, to make everyone aware, which of course we all know is that boy and girls are, you know, from a human perspective, like, you know, genetically, we all are both are wired very differently. I've got a son and a, and a daughter and regardless of, you know, how much I kind of, you know, of course I treat both of them the same, but there's some elements like I won't be able to change. Like my daughter is very fussy about 
the, the, the colors and all those things, whilst my son cares less. So I think there are some genetical differences which we cannot change because that's how some of us are being wired. But I guess then the question is how we make that as a strength and as each one of us, as we have got young kids or, you know, the generation like yourself in where you probably, you know, hopefully a few years time, you know, you might have your own family, then we need to start breaking this now. All those, you know, a brave boy. So, you know, each one of us, because we are forming this generation, my son or Nadia, you know, your son or, you know, they are actually going to be next. So it's, it's as a mother or as a father, you know, equally, it's our job to tell them that they can become anything they want. And it was interesting because it was Nadia's book launch yesterday. So I went back home, I showed the kids the book. So they were leaving the chapter and they were reading my name, of course. And that kind of gave confidence, of course, to my son. But my daughter, you know, when somebody asked her, what do you want to become? She was like, I want to become like mommy and I want to be independent. Like he probably doesn't know the meaning of the word, but I think we all can become role models, not just for our you know, uh, the future, but also for our kids, because they can see if mommy can do it, so can I. And, you know, telling to their friends and that's kind of, you know, percolating across the society. So again, Nadia, back to your point about changing people's mindset. Definitely. And, you know, um, as an executive coach, I actually spent the last 10 years really looking at uh, the imposter syndrome. And one thing I find it, which is quite uh, eye opening, is actually there's no such thing as imposter syndrome, but the stories that we keep telling ourselves. And I like what Nadia has shared earlier by bring this story up to your consciousness and reframe the story. Each one of us actually has the power to create a new narrative about ourselves, about the society. And one thing I notice is uh, actually quite an empowering this approach, right? And the matter of the fact that we are having this conversation today is quite uh, liberating. And, you know, one of the, um, uh, at the board level, right, we organize the women on boards um, kind of executive coaching program. And one of the thing is uh, we discussed, right, it's a TED talk. If any of you didn't, haven't watched that, I strongly uh, advise you watch that, right? It's called the missing 33%. So basically um, the speaker, right, uh, made a really stunning um, uh, fact, right? That uh, he know she noticed uh, one of the key reason there's less women CEOs or in the C-suites than men is because when they're looking at how these fem female being groomed right in their organization is they teach the men about the business and they teach the women about being confident. And that's one of the reasons you don't have a lot of the successful female right raising to the top. So I think one of the, um, the thing each one of you has mentioned is when you notice, right, you've been taught or mentored, right, really focusing on your confidence you can even let people know about your ambition, right? In terms of what you wanted to achieve in the business world. And sometimes just to talk about the unconscious bias is going to really help move the needle and move the conversation. So I think we actually have 10 minutes left for the panel. Uh, we actually uh, have a couple of people um, wanted to, if you wanted to drop out your questions in the chat, feel free to do that. We actually also get some pre-submitted questions that we wanted to leverage the opportunity uh, to check in with Steve uh, from Jenny. Uh, she's been hosting this uh, great topic uh, during the month of March, which is the, inter um, the Women History Month. Uh, she's currently applying for jobs uh, in the fintech industry. She uh, is wondering uh, if you can share some best practices or tips for diverse candidates, how to stand out in the job interview process. So you cut out a bit then, but it sounds like a recruitment question. So Nadia, I would definitely... 
I will definitely Thank answer you. that first. Um, so I think in terms of applications, um, I always advise do many because what a lot of people do is that they will think there's a, let's say there's a hundred opportunities. They'll just apply for three because those three suit them. They think the best. Now, actually, I'm a big believer in roles being molded around the individual. And once you get in front of somebody and have an interview with somebody, you can talk about your goals and what you want the role to turn into. And I think this is actually something that will really set people apart when you talk about what you want your growth plan to be. Rather than waiting for a company to tell you what their growth plan could be for you, think about where you what you want to be doing next. What things are you passionate about? And actually, even within the application, talking about your passions, your background, your your thought processes. And for me, what's so, so important is this, this new notion that people didn't really talk about before, which was diversity of thought. This is something that, that is so, so important for fintechs moving forward, because we've got to challenge each other better with our ideas. So I actually think your ability to communicate how you have challenged people positively in your life. You may not have years and years of experience, but how you've challenged people, how you brought people on, on a journey, how you've encouraged people. This mindset of, and this agile mindset of being able to be resilient to hearing lots of no's, but you still go on and you still go on positively. I think this is the real crux of getting a great job within the fintech space. And, and encapsulating that in any application can be done in a number of ways. We still have the traditional cover letters, but I'm encouraging people to really stand out from the crowd by, um, you know, there's, there's tools now on, on LinkedIn, there's free tools you can download, um, voice notes, video pitches, and whatever you do with video pitches, please don't record just one and then have the person's name changed because that betrays the whole, the whole thing that you've done. You, you do a video note specifically for every single new person and what you say should be different because when you're doing these applications, even at the level that I'm talking about, you want it to be really, really specific. You want to have done your research. You want to make sure you're talking about the, the, the mission, the purpose of the business and why that's akin to you. And Wei Lin said earlier about the, the, the wonderful world of fintech and people building products and companies based off their lived experience so often the ceos of these businesses they've built it it's their baby you know they want someone to apply treating it with respect rather than just whacking out your cv and you know hoping for the best so be personal be specific and, and really really show who you are in a different way and videos and voice notes are a great way of doing that and, and i would just kind of add from our from an interview perspective is because um, I, I was being asked this question so a few times. So from an interview perspective, I would say is if you get asked, especially you're not, you know, born and bred in that particular country, a couple of things to, to highlight is that uh, your adaptability and flexibility, that's super key what businesses are looking at because most of the businesses are virtual. Um, when I say virtual, I mean, uh, you know, the boundaries have become virtual less after pandemic. It doesn't matter where you work from. But what really matters is can you connect with people in Hong Kong with the same kind of an empathy with somebody in Japan, whether, whether in US and UK? And if you are someone who has actually, you know, uh, you know, you don't look like those people, you don't speak or talk, your accent is different. And, uh, and, and the best thing is, you know, when uh, my icebreaker always is people ask me, where is this accent from? And I would joke and I would say it's from Dubai. So I think embrace it because that's what makes you unique rather than feeling, oh my God, why are they asking me where my accent is from? It isn't, you know, it is not because you've traveled so many countries. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, embrace it, have fun with it. And, and also, uh, uh, again, there's some, uh, always pick your battles, I would also say, because, you know, uh, sometimes we might become sensitive and we think, oh, somebody's saying something because we're our background or because or whatever. But I think, yeah, so, so just open up your mindset, uh, showcase that what you're going to bring with your global, uh, with your international background and experience and how you understand and how adaptable and flexible you are. And that will definitely help to draw the bottom line. Again, connecting those points from a bottom line standpoint is, is super important. As Nadia said, some of these CEOs have built their business, especially in fintechs. There are lots of startups, 
lots of unicorns in there. They've built up their, you know, it's kind of like their baby. So you need to demonstrate how you can work super hard to, to help them, uh, especially from an, from an ROI standpoint. 100%. I'll add like a quick little tidbit as someone who's also so trying to break great. into awesome. the fintech Thanks. space. Um, I would say one, treat your internationalness or your background and diverse background as a strength rather than a weakness. Oftentimes I look at myself and I'm like, gosh, like it would be so much easier if I was just an American citizen. Oh boy, like wouldn't it be so much easier if I could just like, if I had just lived in California my whole life and like grew up in Silicon Valley. Um, but the really shift and of perspective was looking at my background and looking at all of the places I grew up in as a strength and something that I could bring forward to companies that I potentially work in. Um, and the second is that I feel you applying to jobs is really hard and it's a really difficult process, but reach out to your communities and see if you can find other students in similar areas who are also trying to break into FinTech and connect with them, really network and see if you can find mentors or community to support you throughout the process. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Willing, I have one more question uh, from the audience to you. Uh, so they wanted to know, um, if uh, from C She We See perspective, you guys has any special program for a uh, founder of color or women of color uh, to you know, get uh, resources to fund their own company. And also a similar question is, um, you're only a sophomore at uh, Princeton. So what's, uh, what are some of your advice for young people out there uh, too? So um, they can put themselves out there, jump into opportunities, uh, and then create opportunities for themselves. Yeah, for sure. So I'll answer the first one. Uh, SheVC is actually focused on highlighting stories of GPs and LPs. Um, so if you are a woman founder, I'd say definitely reach out to me and we'd love to have you and highlight your story on uh, my separate podcast called The Entrepreneur's Podcast, where we highlight uh, women entrepreneurs and share stories uh, within our community. So definitely feel free to email me or connect with me on LinkedIn. And in terms of being a student, um, what was your question exactly? So being a student in, sorry, I completely blanked. So I actually have one more question. So two questions. One is uh, as a student, and also how can I create opportunities for myself to put right. myself out there? Awesome. So I think first of all, as a student, it's a really nice thing because at college, or um, at high school, you have a really big safety net, like nothing that you actually do at this point in your life, um, besides like working a job and like paying for rent, for example, um, all of your startup ideas, if they fail, the worst thing that could happen is that they fail and you're still a college student and you still have your education and that is still like the forefront of what you do. So every time I choose to start a new opportunity or think of a new startup, um, I always ask myself, what is the worst thing that can happen? And usually the worst thing that can happen is not even that bad. It's like, it happens, it doesn't work out, or maybe my co-founder doesn't like me at the end of it. Um, and so usually at the college level, like the safety net and the failure isn't that large or astronomical. So I always say, just go for it if it's something that you're passionate about. And then as a student, I think one of the ways that you can contribute to the spaces of DEI initiatives is really share your perspective as someone who's a perspective, um, you know, a job applicant, as, as a student in your school, as someone who's looking almost with fresh eyes in different industries and ask yourself, how are these industries currently solving the problems and addressing the issues of DEI? And how can you move that needle forward? I think are the two big questions I ask myself. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. And then for any of, one, uh, any of you who either missed the session or wanted to continue the conversation, feel free to join um, the Discord group of Working FinTech or contact to all the speakers via LinkedIn uh, to continue the conversation. And also towards the end, I wanted to call out some great, great resources, right? So as Nadia mentioned, she has recently launched a book called uh, FinTech Women Walk the Talk. So get a copy, read those amazing uh, feedbacks, lessons learned, success stories from the amazing FinTech women in her book. 
And I think Willie mentioned that she has um, a podcast series. Nadia has one as well. We'll drop off the link. And I work in FinTech. We also have a podcast series, which is awesome, right? So follow us on LinkedIn. And uh, Pio, anything you wanted to highlight as a resource for the audience? Um, I would say we have got this fantastic fintech community built in, which is, you know, oh, it's all about connecting, networking, content insights, uh, and uh, mentoring and training. So, of course, we work with with, uh, with with Nadia and with yourself. So, you know, we collaborate. So I, I can pop in the link to the community. Of course, you all can join in for free. Um, it is a non-profit community, so, you know, we're not making money out of it, but uh, the aim is to help each other out. So if you want to be part of community and then, yeah, and, and you're going to probably see some of the Nadia's podcasts in there, her book launches in there, and then probably we will kind of, you know, collaborate uh, with yourself as well. And yeah, 